deeply appreciate the sister's insights and her wisdom in articulating the truths of our ancestors. Uh, as you can see how rumors and innuendo give you wrong information, uh, we, did, uh, we see that Brother Martin is here, as you can see, and we are deeply uh, pleased and honored to have his presence. Uh, without further ado, I bring to you Brother Tony Martin, Professor of Africana Studies at Western College. Brother Martin. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thanks very much for everybody for being here. I was asked tonight, I'm not sure what the other panelists were um, asked to do tonight, but I was asked to give a little sort of background concerning what sort of led me into the Afrocentric view of our experience. Um, I was told that this panel tonight, the members of this panel were people who had been in Africana studies for a very long time, and so that we should talk a little bit about our, you know, our struggle, and again, our history of being in black studies, the evolution of our interest in black studies. This happens to be my 25th year at Wellesley College in Massachusetts, 25 years. <laughs> One quarter of a century doing battle with Jews, Gentiles, Negroes, <laughs> and whoever else came against me in the last 25 years, but I'm still standing. <laughs> For about two years before coming to Wellesley, I was also involved in an Africana Studies program at the University of Michigan in Flint. And for two years before that, I was a graduate student doing coursework in Africana Studies at Michigan State University. So altogether, I think this represents both as a student and as a professor, it represents about 29 years in this particular struggle for me. And I know the same is true for the other people on this panel, for Sister Chashi McIntyre, for Len Jeffries, who I understand is also celebrating his 25th year at City College here this year as well. And of course, for, for Jim Turner, who was listed on the panel, who I understand is not here, but Jim Turner goes back even more than 25 years at Cornell University. So here we have a, a whole cadre of people who have hung in there for over a quarter of a century. And I think that this represents you know, a fairly interesting <laughs> achievement, I guess I might say, in our history. Because despite all our shortcomings, it means that we have a cadre of people there who have been able to hang in there to struggle for a very long period of time, and who have been able to stay the course, who have had to deal with um, a level of hostility that's perhaps unmatched in the history of our academic endeavors. So whatever setbacks we have had, I think we do have a lot to celebrate. We do have some people who have um, you know, hung in there and then held the breach and sort of um, you know, been able to stave off the enemy while a new generation hopefully has you know, been developed and is getting ready to step in there and carry on the struggle for another 25 years. So like I said, Sister Nzinga told me to talk a little bit about what went into you know, um, the you know, making, if you like, of an Afrocentrist. So I'm not sure if I can definitively say what caused me to take the orientation that I've taken, but um, I tried to look back over my history, and I came up with a few notes, which I'll share with you for the next few minutes. I'm not sure when I first became aware of, of African-American history, period, of course, as you know, I grew up in Trinidad in the Caribbean. My father, I guess like many people in his generation, had a, an interest in African-American studies, even though he was somewhat laid back and conservative, he did have a library in his house, and as a little kid, I had free reign of his library, and as I look back at it now, I realize that there were one or two books in his library, you know, dealing with African-American history, which I read as a little kid, and you know, one never knows when you expose your children to, to books. I've always argued that there's nothing more important that a you know, parent can do for children than to expose them to, to decent books because you never know what kind of a seed you're planting in little children, you know, when, when they have access to the written word, 
So I read some of these books in my father's library when I was very, very young. There's one book that I still own, which is one of my treasured uh, you know, possessions, a book called Cyclopedia of Negro Thought. It's a book which was published around about 1900 or thereabouts. And what it was was a kind of a, a celebration of 100 years of African-American struggle. You know, it was uh, put in place for the new century. Here was 1900 or somewhere thereabouts, and they were getting ready to enter a new century, and they were celebrating 100 years of African-American struggle. And I think that the book contained photographs and biographical sketches of 100 prominent African-Americans, you know, people like Bishop Turner, Booker T. Washington, people like that. That's one of the books I browsed in as a little kid, and I, I still own it. It's falling apart, but it's one of my you know, great uh, favorite possessions. I seem to recall as a little kid, my father being very fond of um, Marion Anderson. I seem to recall a photograph of Marion Anderson hanging in my house someplace that my father had put up. He was very much into music, and he was very impressed by this particular person. Marion Anderson, I believe, came to Trinidad sometime in the late 40s. As a little kid, I was struck by the fact that she reminded me of an aunt of mine. I always was you know, impressed by this resemblance. Another figure that my father was very impressed with at that particular time was Paul Robeson. And this would be the late 40s, I guess, getting into the early 50s. This would be the time when Paul Robeson, I presume, was um, you know, under a lot of pressure here in this country. You might recall Paul Robeson was hassled by this country during the McCarthy era. He was hassled by the so-called House and american um, Activities Committee. He had his passport taken away for many years. He was you know, one of the great public enemies, number one, together with W.E.B. Du Bois, who also suffered a similar fate in that period. I think Du Bois was about 80-something years old when he was dragged into court in the 1950s and again accused of um, indulging in anti-American affairs and so on. So I'm not sure if that is what attracted Paul Robeson to my father or if it was simply the fact of his great artistic ability, but I seem to recall somehow becoming aware of Paul Robeson as a kid growing up. And he too, I believe, came to Trinidad sometime around about 1948, and that may possibly have spurred the interest in him in my house. So, so the, these were two early you know, little bits and pieces that I can recall that may possibly have, have um, sparked an interest in me. By the 1950s, when I was coming up through elementary school, of course, the civil rights struggle had begun in this country. I don't recall a great deal of, of coverage of the civil rights movement in the very early years in Trinidad, but I do remember one incident that had a, a very profound impact on me, and that was the murder of a white seaman by a couple young brothers in Trinidad. I don't recall what the year was, but what happened was that there was a case from the American South, and I don't recall what state it was. It might have been Alabama, but there was a, a, a black man somewhere in the South in this country who, if my memory serves me right, was sentenced to death for stealing a dollar and a few cents from a white woman. Maybe there might be somebody here in the audience who might recall the specifics of this case. I've been planning to go back and research it for a long time, but I, I, I haven't. But if my memory serves me right, there was this brother somewhere in the South stole, you know, a little bit of money, a dollar or two, from a white, from a white woman, and they you know, invoked some old statute from Lord knows when, maybe slavery times or something. But he was facing a death sentence, and it became a cause celeb around the world. And in Trinidad, um, there were these two young brothers who read this in a paper, and they became so upset reading this in the newspaper that they actually went out and killed the first white man they saw. Um, and I, I distinctly recall that, that case being reported in the newspapers, and that had a hell of an impact on me. As it happens, the man who they killed was some poor Norwegian sailor who just happened to be in Trinidad, you know, took a few hours off his ship. So it was a case of this poor guy was in the wrong place at the wrong time, and he paid, you know, we have a saying in Trinidad, Peter pays for Paul, and Paul pays for all. So this poor man was like Paul. He paid for all the racists in the South, poor fella. Um, I don't recall what the outcome of this particular murder trial was, but I remember that having a great impact on me in terms of, you know, um, bringing to my mind as a young child an awareness of, of, of the situation facing, you know, um, African people, at least in this particular part of the world. In the early 60s, I went off to England as a student, a law student, 
This was 1963. By that time, of course, the civil rights movement would have been in full swing. And at that point, my experience of the civil rights movement was largely through television. I remember being in a dorm in London where there was one television in the basement and we used to gather in the basement and watch the nightly news. And I remember that by 63, the civil rights movement in this country you know, was a fairly frequent item on the nightly news in London. And that too was a kind of a, a consciousness raiser. It was during this period in 1965, for, um, to be exact, as a law student, when I had the privilege of seeing Malcolm X. I remember being in the library one day in the law school, and I met a Ghanaian brother who was a good friend of mine, and he told me, hey, um, Malcolm X is speaking at the London School of Economics, you know, in about an hour's time, <laughs> let's go and hear him. So of course, that was the end of work for the day. The London School of Economics was just a few minutes walk down the road. So we went and we heard Malcolm. This was about two weeks before Malcolm was killed. You might recall that when they killed Malcolm, he had been in Europe. He had gone to France. They had refused him entry into France. Then he had gone to England, and he had made a, you know, at least one speech, I suspect some more. He came back home from that speech. I suspect this must have been early February of 1965, but I seem to think it was a couple of weeks before he was killed. <clears throat> That speech you know, is also very vividly etched in my memory, and I don't know what impact that speech may have had. You know, one never knows. But this is another little you know, signpost, I guess, along the way. In 1965, I, went, I left London and went to Hull, University of Hull, which is a couple hundred miles or so uh, north of London. And I became an economics major there. And I was very much involved in student politics in that period. And that, too, might have been a kind of a consciousness raiser. The African-American struggle at that point was beginning to impact more and more on our lives in England. I remember as a student there, a couple of members of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. I remember them being on tour and coming through our university and you know, giving a speech and raising some money and so on. I, I recall Martin Luther King coming to England around that time. And I remember us, the black students on campus, making a vain effort to try to get him to come and speak you know, to us. Of course, we weren't very organized. I, I, I seem to recall we were ringing the American Embassy or something to try to find out where he was. But um, it didn't work, but at least we had the idea. You know, we tried, we made a little effort. In, in this period, as a student politician, I got the opportunity to, to travel in a variety of countries. And um, because the civil rights struggle here was a, was a major thing in, you know, in any progressive gathering anywhere in the world, the civil rights struggle here, you know, sooner or later would come on the agenda in some form or fashion. I remember being at an international student conference in, in, in Cuba in 1966, and the Cubans at that time, of course, were just out of the Bay of Pigs. This is just five years after the Bay of Pigs, and they were very upset as they had every right to be. And I recall that the black struggle in this country was one of the great items that they were um, you know, propagandizing and they were trying to contrast what they considered to be their great race, race relations and revolutionary Cuba with the situation here. I seem to recall them showing a documentary on the civil rights struggle. This is in Cuba, 1966. I recall them showing a documentary. And if, if my memory serves me right, I think it was an English language documentary. It must have been made here, but it had Spanish subtitles. I think it was called Now or something like that. It was, it was a documentary on the civil rights uh, movement in this country. In this period, 65 to 68, while I was a student of economics, perhaps the uh, greatest single event, you know, impacting on the lives of young black people in England in that period was the visit of, of Kwame Touri, then Stokely Carmichael. He came to London in 1967, and his impact was, I think, even greater than that of Malcolm X. Uh, it might have been the time, it might have been a whole mix of, of circumstances. But when Stokely, as he then was, came to, to London, at the time I was president of the, what was called the Union of West Indian Students in Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And West Indian students at that time in England would have been you know, the black students. So that would have been like a, a nationwide sort of a black student organization in Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And we had a headquarters in London, and we brought Stokely to speak at our headquarters in London, and, and that, that was a very memorable, memorable event. I think that Stokely almost single-handedly brought into being a black power movement in England, you know, in, in that brief period, about a week or so that he was over there in England. 
he had a, an incredible impact. You know, a whole bunch of organizations sprang up the moment he left. You know, and all of a sudden, almost overnight, there was a black power movement in England as well. The night that Stokely spoke to us at the end of his speech, I recall that the uh, police swooped down on the building. We were standing outside the building with Stokely, you know, uh, you know just talking after the lecture. And there seems to have been a premeditated plan on the part of the police. As I look back at it, it appears as though they were start, uh, trying to start a riot. But the building was at a corner, and, and, and the police came from all the directions, you know, from, from you know, every direction, so that, you know, they had us kind of pinned in there, and they began to provoke people. But luckily, somebody had their wits together and, and you know, put Stokely in a car and got him out of there in, in a hurry. Now, the very next day after this near problem, you know, the problem was averted, but the very next day, the British government banned uh, Kwame Ture from England, the very, very next day. And so as I look back at it, it appears to me as though the, the plan had been to maybe start some kind of a little riot there or something, which would have given them a more plausible excuse, a pretext for banning Stokely. I think they, they were trying to find you know, um, a means to say, well, Stokely came here and incited violence, therefore we banned him. The violence was not incited, but they banned him, of course, anyway. About a day or so after the British government banned Kwame Ture, the Trinidad government turned around and did likewise. As you know, Kwame Ture was born in Trinidad. He grew up in Trinidad up to age 12 or thereabouts. So here was the Trinidad government, you know, um, following the, you know, the queue of the, of the British government, and they banned him too. The very next day, I think, after the British government did. At that point, the students, the Caribbean students, we um, had a demonstration, as I recall, in Hyde Park. Hyde Park is the big park in London where all the political demonstrations have always taken place. In fact, Marcus Garvey used to speak in Hyde Park many years ago. Just about every political figure who has gone through um, England has spoken there at some point. Sailor James spoke there. George Padmore spoke there in the 1930s and so on, Hyde Park. So we had a, a demonstration in Hyde Park. The main speaker we had was C.L.R. James, who came, came along, spoke to us. So all of these then were events, you know, uh, I, I suppose, helping to build consciousness in that period. It was around this period, too, that I discovered Marcus Garvey and bought my first book on Marcus Garvey. It was an awful book written by a white man, a book called Black Moses. But despite the fact that the book was awful, the book, you know, portrayed Garvey as a fool, as a buffoon. It referred to him in the most disrespectful way, you know, um, this little pudgy Jamaican. Imagine you're writing a book about Marcus Garvey and you're referring to him as this pudgy little Jamaican. You know, stuff like that. Very insulting stuff like that. Unfortunately, at the time, it was the only thing available on Garvey. And so a lot of people had their attitudes towards Garvey poisoned by that book because it had a monopoly of the market for several years. Luckily, I was able to read that book. And even though at the time, I didn't necessarily have the documentation to disprove it, but I could instinctively tell that you know, something was wrong with this book because I remember saying to myself, in fact, I actually wrote this later on in the um, preface to race first, but I remember saying to myself, how can a man lead the largest mass movement in, 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 uh, in Pan-African history? You know, starting with no resources, from nothing, building from scratch, you know, and in a very short space of time, building the largest, most powerful movement we've ever had. How can a man do that and be a buffoon or a, or a clown or a fool? You know, something just wasn't making sense in this book. They had to admit what Garvey did. There's no way they could get around admitting what Garvey had done. But at the same time, they were portraying him as a fool. And I said to myself, fools do not build the kind of movement that Garvey built, fighting against the weight of the Communist International, fighting against the weight of the US government, you know, the weight of the integrationist establishment and the Jewish backers, you know, fighting against a whole conglomeration of, of hostile forces, such as which I have very few African leaders have ever had to deal with. And here was Garvey building in the face of this incredible hostility from the left and the right. Here was a man who was able to build the most powerful movement we ever had. How could such a man be a fool? You know, fools don't do that. Um, so I realized there was, a, there was a major fundamental flaw in the book, even though I couldn't, like I said, document um, you know, these concerns at the time. But of course, that's what spurred me on to eventually do my PhD dissertation on Marcus Garvey, you know, trying to 
to, to, to um, right the wrong that was done by that particular book. In 1968, I went back to Trinidad, taught for a year, and by this time, black power had begun to internationalize itself. One interesting aspect of African American history is that whenever there has been a period of intense activity, intense political activity in African America, it has always tended to assume a pan-African character. In Marcus Garvey's time, the same thing happened. The Garvey movement started going here. In fact, Garvey wasn't even unique here. Garvey was part of the wider movement that was known as the New Negro Movement. And the New Negro Movement, once it took root here, once people like Garvey began to concretize it here, it began to move overseas. Garvey's movement became, as you know, the largest international pan-African movement we've ever had. It spread like wildfire. It was in South Africa, it was in Australia, it was in Europe, South America, the Caribbean, everywhere that our people lived. The Harlem Renaissance, the uh, literary aspect of the New Negro Movement, that too spread overseas as well. So the same thing happened again in the 1960s. Once black power took root here, it began to manifest itself overseas. Like I said, the visits of people like Malcolm X and, and, and Kwame Touré to places like England helped to bring it to Europe. Malcolm X, as you know, uh, visited Africa as well. There were conferences in, in, in Canada. Um, there was a lot of movement back and forth from the Caribbean to North America. So by the time I got home in 68 from England, you know, the um, black power thing was beginning to take off in Trinidad. There was one incident especially which uh, brought it home to Trinidad, and that was the famous incident that took place in Montreal, Canada in 1968 when um, there was a, a great confrontation at a university called uh, the Sir George William University. I think this, they've since renamed it. I, I think it's called Concordia University or something like that now. But what happened was that there was a racist professor there who used to mark down black students. He wasn't the first racist professor to do it, No, unfortunately was he the last. But somehow the students were able to document what he was doing. I think they sent you know, a black and a white student in the class, you know, and gave them the same paper to give this guy, and, you know, the exact same paper, and the guy must have given the white student an A and a black student a C or something for the exact same paper. So they were able to document what he was doing, and this started a whole protest movement. Things escalated, you know, um, the administration apparently was dragging its feet in terms of disciplining this white professor. The black students took over a building, the computer building, I think it was, the police were called in, the black students uh, burnt down the building, caused several million dollars worth of, of damage, destroyed the, the computer system and so on. And that led to a huge confrontation. Uh, you know, a large number of uh, black students were imprisoned. And the students in Trinidad began to demonstrate in solidarity with the black students in Canada, many of whom had been from Trinidad, but not all. They were from all over, but many of them were from Trinidad. Around that time, the Governor General of Canada paid a visit to Trinidad, a goodwill visit. And the uh, president, the prime minister of Trinidad at that, at that time, Eric Williams, took this governor general to the university in Trinidad, a place called St. Augustine. And the students, I remember, blocked the gate. They wouldn't let this guy come in. So the prime minister had to turn around and go back home. And that was the beginning of, of, of this you know, intense period of activity. You know, um, demonstrations began, people began to to demonstrate against Canadian banks, against Canadian businesses, against the Canadian High Commission, as they call the embassy over there, and so on. And, and that uh, you know, a struggle was led by students on campus who were joined later on by workers, by the unemployed. And one of the great movements in our history you know, arose around that struggle, an organization that came to be known as NJAC, the National Joint Action Committee, NJAC one of the great uh, mass movements in, in, in the struggle in Trinidad and in the Caribbean. So that was happening then around 68, 69, when um, I went back home to Trinidad for a year. So here, I, I guess, was another area of consciousness building, you know, looking at what was happening and participating um, you know, in a minor kind of a way. I ended up in the US of A in 1969. In the fall of 69, I arrived at Michigan State University in, East Lansing, Michigan, and that, that began a very fascinating and very intense period. By the time I got to Michigan State, I guess I was more or less ready, having observed and read and participated in a minor way in a, in a variety of things over the years. So you might say I hit the ground running. 
within about two or three months, I was one of the leaders of the Black Student Union on campus. Within a month of arriving at Michigan State, I went to Montreal. I was an African Studies you know, um, PhD student, and they took us to a conference in Montreal, a conference organized by the African Studies Association, which was the academic association of, of Africanists, most of whom at that time in this country were white. The school I was at, Michigan State University, had one of the largest African studies programs you know, of any campus. And if I recall right, there were something like 24 faculty members in our African studies program at Michigan State, of whom one was an African American and, and the rest were white. So I went up there to, to Montreal. I think it might have been around October or so of 1969. I was in this country exactly one month or thereabouts. And in Montreal, that was the precise conference that our, our Afrocentric scholars chose to make the great play. That was when the Afrocentric scholars challenged the white hegemony over African studies, which was represented by the African Studies Association. That was when Dr. John Henry Clark, who was the leader of that movement, you know, Dr. Clark, I, I recall, you know, um, you know, came there and took over the movement. Uh, Len Jeffries was, was there and people like that. And I, I recall being totally, uh, you know, fascinated as a young student there. You know, I, I, I remember being in a, in a workshop, you know, and, and Dr. Clark and a whole bunch of black folk came into the workshop. We were in, a, we were in a, some big hotel in Montreal. They came in, they came in, they just barged in in the middle of these people's workshop, grabbed the microphone, you know, um, <laughs> Dr. Clark made a speech, you know, about, you know, something to the effect that, you know, the, the uh, white hegemony over African studies had to come to an end, and this was a good time to end it. And he invited all the black people in, in the workshop to come on out of the workshop and follow him to the next room, and then we'd have a black meeting in some other room when we had disrupted all the workshops and so on. <laughs> So Dr. Clark was like the Pied Piper, you know, and he was going from room to room. And every room he went to, all the black folk fell out behind him, so the crowd of black folk were getting larger and larger as he went through this, this great hotel. I remember standing at one point in the midst of all this, I remember standing near to the elevator, and there were two white gentlemen there who were obviously two of the people in charge of the conference. I don't know who they were, but they were earnestly discussing whether to call the police or not. You know, they were very, very upset, very perturbed. So I recall, you know, we had a big meeting there somewhere in the hotel, and, you know, and, and that is largely where the African Heritage Studies Association was formed. I know it had its genesis a year earlier in 68, I believe in California. Len Jeffries will be able to tell you exactly. But um, that's where it really, you know, um, seriously got going. So here, too, was an incredible consciousness raiser. And here was I, just one month in this country, <laughs> being an eyewitness to this incredible historic event. And I'll never forget Dr. Clark coming in there and just taking the people's meeting over. And like I said, and, and I fell in behind them. We went from room to room to room. You know how they have in these big conferences, they have like maybe 10, 20 workshops going on simultaneously. So he just went from workshop to workshop, pulled the black folk out. And that was the beginning of the African Heritage Studies Association. So my mind was all filled with all of this. I came back to Michigan State, got back to Michigan State to discover that while I was in Montreal, the, the radical black students on campus had taken over the African Studies Center on campus. <laughs> there was a Kenyan brother, a very, very powerful brother, a very strong brother named Minor Kenyatti. He was head of something called PASOA, the Pan-African Students Organization of the Americas, PASOA. In fact, I think I joined that organization the first day I went on the campus, the very, very first day. Um, as a foreign student, you know, we had to report to the foreign student office on the first day we went on campus to get all our papers fixed up and whatnot. So I walked into the uh, foreign student office and there was this pile of flyers inviting, you know, all these African students to join Paso and I picked up one and I guess an hour or two later I met this brother, Minor. And so I joined that organization more or less on the first day um, at Michigan State University.
So that was Passoa. So, so here I had come from Montreal, right back to Michigan State, where, where the African students and African American, led by this Kenyan brother, had taken over the African Studies Center. And that began a whole series of events that lasted for the two years that I was on campus there. You know, I became one of the people involved very intimately in it. We demanded that there should be more black faculty in the Afri African Studies program. We demanded a black person in charge of it. Of course, they found a Nigerian brother who was not very strong, unfortunately, as so often happens. This happened so many times in the early years of, of the black studies movement, you know, where black students would go out on a limb, you know, um, expose themselves to danger, sometimes even be arrested or whatnot, um, you know, demanding you know, black people in black studies. But unfortunately, very often, you found that the black folk who were in place, you know, who had the qualifications, very often weren't the ones who had the consciousness you know, you know, you know, those who were radical made a place for these fools, and very often, unfortunately, all they saw was more money and a better job, but they didn't, they didn't share, you know, the, the perspective of the people who had made those kinds of jobs possible for them. But for the next two years, like I said, I was very much involved in that. In fact, they set up a special kind of a joint committee to run the African Studies Center, made up of both students and professors. And I was, I was one of the students who was appointed to that committee. So for a while, we had some real power in there, you know, calling the shots and whatnot. But of course, over the years, I think things kind of, you know, dissipated somewhat. But we did make a little impact for a while. One of the things we got out of that was a magazine. We started publishing a magazine. We got them to fund a magazine published by the black students on campus. We called it Mazungumzo. And again, this brother, Minor from Kenya, was the one who came up with that name, Mazungumzo. I think he said Mazungumzo was Swahili, Yuki Swahili for um, understanding, if I recall right. We went through several editions of, of Mazungumzo. One of the earliest editions, it might have been the very first edition, I'm not sure, but we sent one of the earliest editions to, to Dr. John Henry Clark, you know, for him to see what we were doing. And he um, wrote back, you know, a most uh, helpful and encouraging letter, which we published in the magazine. So, we, you know, if anybody goes back, they can find, you know, Dr. John Henry Clark's comments. But it was very hard thing to us at the time as graduate students to have this kind of encouragement coming from somebody like John Henry Clark. And that's one of the things I always remember, you know, the, the, the way he encouraged us as young, you know, struggling graduate students coming along. And I think among his many attributes, I think that that's one that ought to be um, remembered. He was always willing to help, to inspire those coming along. <clears throat> it was during this period, too, that I discovered Dr. Ben. I think it was the same, it was the same brothers in Paso and sisters uh, who somehow heard that Dr. Ben was coming to Detroit one time and somehow they got Dr. Ben, you know, to come on over to Michigan State. Michigan State is maybe an hour and a half or so by road from Detroit. So they got him to sort of, you know, they piggybacked on his visit to Detroit and brought him over. Dr. Ben came over and of course he was a, a great revelation. I'm sure everybody in this room has gone through that same experience of the first time they heard Dr. Ben. Um, <laughs> It was like a totally mind-blowing kind of an experience. So this might have been around, I'm not sure, this might have been around 1970 or thereabouts. Of course, I've heard Dr. Ben many hundreds of times since, but I'll never forget that first time. I believe I bought a couple of his books that first day, you know, Black Man of the Nile, and maybe one or two others that day. So all of this, again, you know, was just adding to consciousness as we went along. Like black students at the time, in every university, breakfast program going for kids. So we started a breakfast program in Lansing, Michigan, you know, things like that. We tried to involve ourselves in what little way we could in the community. But nevertheless, it was also a time of a very great intellectual and academic uh, stimulation as well. You know, some of the most um, intellectually stimulating years of my life, I think, were the couple of years I spent as a grad student. And, and I, again, I'm fairly sure we weren't unique. I'm sure this was true for many other you know, um, schools, maybe for most schools where there was a critical mass of black students. Because so much was happening politically, and because here were we you know, as graduate students, we were studying C.L.R. James, we were studying Marcus Garvey, George Padmore, Karl Marx, we were studying all kinds of people, Lenin, Chairman Mao, and there was so much happening on the streets in the name of so many of these people. So it was a very unique time in which we were able to try to, to relate 
what we were studying, you know, to the actual experience that was happening all around us. And we spent, as grad students, you know, we would spend many a long hour discussing, you know, people like the people I just mentioned, arguing, debating about people like that. So even though we were active, we were nevertheless trying to, to ground our activity, you know, in, in, in some real intellectual activity. And, and I think that this is the essence of what I think an ideal graduate school or any school experience should be, to try to relate that kind of academic experience to, to, to what's happening, you know, in the concrete world. And so we were very fortunate, I think, to be graduate students in that period. And there was an incredible cadre at Michigan State. Michigan State, I believe, actually had the largest number of black students at the time, so they said, of any school in the States at the time, uh, or at least of any white school, I should say. I I'm not sure, but I seem to recall that there was something like about 3,000 or so black students there on campus. Michigan State, as you know, is one of the biggest schools in the country. At, at the time, there was like 40-something thousand students altogether, with about maybe 3,000 or so black students which was a, a very large critical mass of black students, and this is 1969, 70. And if I'm not mistaken, I heard them say it was perhaps the largest number of, of black students on any one campus. So we had a real basis for this kind of intellectual and um, organizational activity. Like all black students, we brought people to campus, you know, who were involved in the struggle. I remember Huey P. Newton coming to the campus one time. The day he came to campus, I remember the, you know, the black students wanted to to do a little kind of a bodyguard thing for Huey. You know how Huey, Huey, Huey used to speak with people all around him, you know, he would be here and people would be all forming a kind of a human shield around him. I remember saying that I loved the brother dearly, but I don't think I was ready to die for him yet. Um, my commitment hadn't gotten to the point where I felt like dying for Huey Newton. But um, I did admire the brother nevertheless but I was reluctant to become part of his human shield on that particular occasion. <laughs> it was in this period, too, that a couple of carloads of us left Michigan State and traveled to Atlanta, Georgia, in 1970 to the Congress of African People. The Congress of African People is one of the great pan-African meetings in African-American history. It was in the tradition of the black power meetings that used to take place in those days. In the 60s, there was a tradition of black power gatherings, and that in itself was part of a very ancient tradition in African-American history. You know, um, Martin Delaney, back in the 1850s, said that we were a nation within a nation. And one of the ways you, this has really manifested itself over the years is the way that African-Americans have almost instinctively um, you know, um, brought into being structures, governmental structures for the race. It's very interesting, but way back in the, in the 18 teens, you know, you found black folk having what they used to call the uh, annual so-called uh, Negro conventions in the 1830s, you know, um, right through the 19th century. You have a kind of a govern, government structure is what it was, you know, where the leaders of the race would get together every few years and have their conventions in fact, many of the minutes of these conventions are available now. That they were published, you know, they are, they are actually available now in book form. You know, where folks would get together like a government, like, like, like a congress. And they would debate the condition of the race and come up with ideas as to how to, you know, uplift the race and so on. So that was a very old tradition. Marcus Garvey's conventions in, in the 1920s were part of that same tradition. When Marcus Garvey in 1920 had his first international convention of the Negro peoples of the world right here in New York City with 25,000 people turning out. You know, and people coming as delegates. People, you know, it, was, it was like a congress. You know, people were coming as delegates from different places, from different organizations. It was a congress of the race. And so that tradition was very much in place in the 1960s with the Black Power Conferences. The Congress of African Peoples was one of the largest, perhaps the largest, of these Black Power Conferences. It took place down there in Atlanta. It was international in scope. There were people there from all over the place. I remember there were Australian Aborigines there. I remember people from New Guinea in the Pacific were there. There were folks from just about every place. Of course, all the usual places all over this country, you know, the African continent, the Caribbean, and so on. Out of that, there was a, an effort to set up a permanent organization out of the Congress of African People. I remember I was elected to the history workshop. There were, it was broken down in a variety of subject areas. And for about a couple of years after, there was an effort to keep it going. I remember coming from Michigan State to meetings right here in Harlem. It must have been around 1970, 71. 
you know, you know, meetings that, that would try to keep this going and turn it into a permanent organization. Amiri Baraka is the man who was most associated with that particular effort, the Congress of African People. But that, as so often happens, fell apart over the years. The orientation changed from a black nationalist group, which it was originally. I think Amiri Baraka took it into a more Marxist, Leninist, Mao Zedong thought, thought kind of orientation. And that finally fizzled out. But here, too, you had a whole bunch of black graduate students and undergrads, too, from Michigan State going down there. The conference, I think, may have been about a week or so. So here you had a very rich experience, too. And, uh, and I'm sure that, again, my situation wasn't unique. I mean, you know, there must have been thousands, and in fact, there were thousands of black students at that time who were experiencing the same kinds, you know, the, the, same, the same kinds of influences and, and, and hopefully, uh, you know, building towards an Afrocentric kind of perspective um, because of these influences. In 1971, I went to teach at the University of Michigan in Flint. And again, almost as soon as I got there, I found myself embroiled in an effort to set up a black studies program. This is 1971. I got there in the fall of 71, and apparently the year before I got there, some students and administrators had been trying to get a black studies program going, but either due to lack of experience, perhaps, or maybe lack of a proper perspective, the plan they had come up with was a very inadequate plan, and the students were beginning to get fed up of the, you know, the administrators who were working with them. I remember being amazed when I looked at the plan they had worked out, and the plan consisted of two or three new jobs for the administrators, and that was basically it. You know, they had two or three new jobs whereby the guys who were involved would get an increase of salary and a nice title. You know, you know um, they would be in charge of community events or outreach or something like that. But there was no major, there was no minor, there were no courses, there was no proposal for bringing new professors in, nothing like that. So when I got there, the students came to me, you know, and we reworked the whole thing and, and got a proper program going. And so I became the coordinator of that program. And we, we called it a program in African Afro-American Studies. That was 1971. So that was my first experience at the university level in actually running a black studies program. That went on for a couple of years. It was a very rewarding experience. And of course, I got to Wellesley College in 1973. And they had just started their black studies program. I was one of the first professors who they hired. In fact, I got to Wellesley simultaneous with the beginning of the black studies program. The black studies program began at Wellesley at the same time that I got there. A year before, they had hired a brother, and his job was to hire three or four more people and get the program going. So I was, I was one of the three or four more people that he hired. So at Wellesley, I, I found myself once more, you know, right there um, on the ground floor of a, another black studies program. And of course, 25 years later, I'm still there having, like I said earlier, battled everything that they threw against me. And there again, my experience is not unique. I was hired jointly by history and black studies, but as often happens, once the history people figured out where I was coming from ideologically, they became somewhat alarmed. And so two years later, I got tenure, and, and they made sure they found a full-time position in black studies to, to, to tenure me, which was fine by me because it meant I didn't have to deal with them. I didn't have to get their permission to do anything. I could do my own thing. But it was very fascinating how, how that operated. You know, from half history, I became full black studies. They be, they, I, I remember they stopped. They kind of stopped inviting me to the meetings after a while. They didn't tell me anything. They just stopped inviting me to the history department meetings. But it was very fascinating. You know, they, they hired me because my credentials were good. But once they figured where my perspective was at, they realized that they had made a mistake. But it was kind of late at that point. 25 years later, I'm sure they must still regret their mistake every night before they go to sleep. But what can I do? What can I do? I need a job. I can't just resign, but stay there and take the money and do something positive with it. The challenges over the years at Wellesley, again, are the same kind of challenges that I'm sure everybody has had in black studies everywhere. The Negroes have been a real challenge from time to time. I remember some years ago going into the school bookstore at the beginning of the semester and discovering to my horror that one of my colleagues in, in what used to be called a black studies department at the time was using 
the book called Slavery by Stanley Elkins in his class. This is a black man in a black studies department using Stanley Elkins' book called Slavery. This book, Slavery, was a book that uh, argued that you know, the Sambo type was the correct stereotype for black people during slavery, that we were Sambos, that we loved old master, that we cried when old master died. And this was a black man in a black studies department. And that was what he was having his black students read. You know, it's, it's like uh, Carter Woodson in The Miseducation of the Negro. You remember Carter Woodson? Carter Woodson said that, uh, you know, if, if, if you miseducate the Negroes, then you, you don't need the white folk anymore. You just miseducate the Negroes and just sick them on the rest of us. You know, they'll take care of business. <clears throat> you remember Carter Woodson said that uh, if you train the Negro to, you know, go to the back of the house, you remember Carter Woodson said if there was no back door, he would go and he'd punch a hole in the wall just to find some place to walk through the back at. Carter Woodson talked about Washington, D.C. This is 1933 when he published this book. Carter Woodson said in Washington, D.C. there were some you know, decent black restaurants, and of course this was the era of segregation. Woodson said there were some decent restaurants there, black restaurants, where black folk could go and eat in dignity, but there were some white establishments you know, where black folk could not go and sit down and eat. There was, you know, there was sit down service for white folk, but black folk would have to go by a side window and be given their food in a paper bag and have to go and find some place else to eat it. And Woodson was saying there were black folk who, would, who preferred that kind of indignity, you know, um, just to get some white food rather than have to go to a, a black restaurant. So unfortunately, that's the kind of position that also dogged us at the university level as well. Fortunately, at Wellesley, um, you know, over the years, I've had a, a very good cadre of, of black students. Um, of course, there have been positive and negative black students. But on the whole, the black students have been very, very encouraging. And I think that if, if the black students I've seen for the last 25 years are uh, in any way symptomatic of what's out there generally, I think that you know, we have much to be hopeful for because I think there's a, there's a lot, there are a lot of black students who have come through black studies programs, I think, in the last 25 years who have come out of there with their heads in you know, pretty, pretty good shape. I'm still in touch with a lot of these students now at Wellesley, and many of them are in very influential positions, and I, I at least hope that many of them, in their quiet little ways, are helping wherever they find themselves to bring a certain you know, proper perspective to whatever they do. You know, I look around, I see students of mine who are now lawyers, and doctors, judges, all kinds of things, you know, and, and some of them, I still speak to them once in a while, and I, I'm fairly hopeful that some of them are making a positive impress into whatever uh, situation they found themselves in. Of course, the most, the most um, challenging of the various enemy forces thrown against me in the last 25 years, of course, was the Jewish onslaught. And they, they came against me five years ago. And they proved to, the, to be the most formidable of all the various forces. <coughs> the others I could, you know, beat with one hand behind my back. The Jews, I think I needed both hands for that last five years. <laughs> but both hands proved to be sufficient to do the job, I must say. <laughs> the Jews came against me with the usual bag of dirty tricks. The lies, the half truths, the hysteria, the loud noise their control of the media, the intimidation of all those around them, all of the old dirty tricks that they had perfected over the years. But luckily for me, you know, they came against me at the same time as Len Jeffries was standing up, at the same time that the Afrocentric movement was really beginning to, to find itself, you know, and to become conscious of itself at a time when there was a real, a real constituency, a hardcore constituency developing all over this country. So in a sense, they picked a bad time because I think the major mistake they made was that the tricks that they had used over the years you know, had, had, had worked. But what they didn't realize is that they were now facing a new kind of an African. And the old tricks wouldn't work as easily. <laughs> So by the time they discovered they were facing a new kind of African who was not going to back away, 
who was not going to apologize for something he never did, like old Jesse Jackson, who was not going to roll over and play dead, who, who was not going to go to Geneva to kowtow and bow down before the World Jewish Congress. By the time they figured out they had a new black man and woman to deal with, who wasn't only willing and able to resist, but who was willing and able to counterattack and take the battle to them. By the time they figured out what was going on, they had made so many mistakes and they had really, you know, they had exposed their hands and they had made themselves look so stupid and ignorant that it was very difficult for them to regroup. Of course, they are still trying to regroup even now. And if one looks back at the last five years, it's fascinating to see the way they have tried to regroup, especially around the question that really precipitated this whole thing, that is the Jewish role in the slave trade. And that's what really precipitated this whole thing. In my own case, as you might recall, I was using the book The Secret Relationship Between Blacks and Jews, which documents thoroughly from their own historians, you know, um, their great role in, in the African slave trade. In the past, they would have been able simply to walk into my classroom and tell me not a teacher tonight, I would have said, okay, master, um, sorry, I won't teach it anymore. And that's what they've done, they've done in the past. But this time around, of course, it, it didn't work. And unfortunately for them, the more noise they made, and again, you know, in the past, if they had gone to the newspapers and denounced me as they did, usually in the past, that would have been enough to get me fired. But this time, it didn't work. They went to the papers, they denounced me. I went back to the papers, I, I took them on. It didn't quite work. And so the more noise they made, and the more they tried to denounce me and people like Len Jeffries, the more the word got out that the Jews were in fact involved in the slave trade. <laughs> so everybody who didn't know before got to find out. <laughs> I remember I spoke at a school, um, Worcester State College in 1994, I think it was, for, for Black History Month. And when the Jews discovered I was coming to speak at Worcester State College, you know, they had a Jewish fit. There was a Jewish uh, <coughs> Hebrew fit. They had a Jewish woman on the uh, Board of Trustees, and she resigned, they made a big thing about it, she resigned, because they invited me to come and talk at the school. And she went to the media, and you know how this is, they control the media, so it was no problem to get it on TV every night. The biggest newspapers had it front page every day. The mayor of Worcester, this is the second largest city, I believe, in Massachusetts. The mayor of Worcester actually called a press conference to denounce my coming to speak at, at, at Worcester State College. The mayor of Worcester, he called a press conference, invited all the media, and got all the religious leaders in the city. He had a rabbi there, he had an orthodox primate, he had a Catholic archbishop, he had a head of the NAACP, a Negro, he had a Baptist preacher, for good measure. Can you imagine that? All because they invited me to come and speak for, for Black History Month. I must say the brothers who invited me were so strong, though it was, you know, they had an office of minority or student affairs or something like that, and they were so strong. They, just, they were cool, they just stood fast. The uh, president of Worcester State College, the Jews got to him and he actually wrote the Attorney General of the state of Massachusetts asking for a legal opinion you know, as to whether he could legally a, prevent me from speaking, and or B, you know, grab my honorarium and, 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 and have me not get paid. <laughs> now, I didn't, even, I didn't even know I had friends in the uh, Attorney General's office, man, but somebody in the Attorney General's office leaked this correspondence to me. They sent me a whole sheaf of correspondence, the letter from the president, and about two or three different legal opinions, and they sent it all to me, you know, just anony anonymously. I don't know who did it. <laughs> So sometimes we have friends in places that we don't even suspect. As a matter of fact, one of the great fascinating aspects of this whole Jewish thing for the last five years has been the letters I've gotten from white people. Um, and I've come to the conclusion that there are a lot of white people out there who are very upset with the Jews for a variety of reasons, but who are so cowed by them that they are afraid to respond. And they Actually, amazingly as it may seem, they're actually looking to us for leadership. And they see us fighting back, and this is giving them courage. <laughs>
It's the most incredible thing. And these are white folk who don't necessarily like black folk either, but, but, but by seeing us fighting back, they have developed a new kind of respect for us. There was one white man from a white supremacist organization somewhere in the Midwest who wrote me. And, um, and I've gotten many letters from white supremacists. Uh, friendly letters. You know. um, I'm serious. I'm serious. I'm talking about some friendly letters. Like there are one or two folks who have contacted me. If I, if I told you the, the names, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't believe it. But this one white man I remember wrote me, and his letter was so interesting. He said to me, he said to me, um, you know, your leaders, meaning me as a black person, he said, you know, your leaders are standing up to these people, man. He said, he said, I wish that we, meaning white folks, he said, I wish that we had leaders like you have, you know, who were strong enough to stand up to these people. This is a white man writing me, you know, the most, most incredible thing. <laughs> and I think that the biggest nightmare, I, I think that the biggest nightmare that the Jews have at this point is the nightmare of some kind of a strategic alliance between white folk and us directed at them. That's their great nightmare because in the past they've always you know, held us up as the buffer to take the blows while they slunk off to the side free. But if we were ever powerful enough to stand back you know, and then let, let those folks deal with them directly because as long as we were there, we kind of absorbed the racism. But I think the Jews are afraid that if we ever became strong enough to just stand aside, and let the other folks take them on directly without us in between to take the blows for them. You know, I think this is the great nightmare. Um, but yet, the more noise they make, the more they make that kind of nightmare possible. So that then was the greatest of my many challenges at Wellesley. And that, that challenge, of course, still continues. Right now, I'm involved in about three court cases against them. I've got a couple of libel suits going. I've just bought a suit against the college, all arising from this Jewish business. So, again, I know, I, I would say that my experience for the last 25 years then is not unique. Everything that I've said, I think almost anybody in black studies for the last 25 years could say. I think we all went through the same process of you know, rising consciousness based on the civil rights movement, based on the black power movement, based on reading the works of Marcus Garvey and Sierra James and people like that. I think we all battled the same problems on campus. We all had to deal you know, with, with the white people, the Gentiles, with the Negroes. In the last five years, increasingly, we have had to deal with the Jewish question. The good news, I think, is that despite the fact that we may have suffered some reverses, after all, we are in a war, and every war has, you know, it's ups and its downs, you win some battles and you lose some. We will always lose some, but I think we have won a lot. And I think that we should be really pretty proud of ourselves. And I think that ASCAC, as I always say, ASCAC in many ways represents, I think, the high point of that struggle of the last 25 years. Because what ASCAC has done is to bring into being, you know, uh, an organization that brings the progressive scholars together with people.